All right, this is the first lore bonus video. We will go through the archives. The archives collect information about past reigns as well as recorded history of the kingdom. In previous chapters of the story, all recorded chronicles uncover mysteries and an encyclopedia that contains information about the kingdom and the known world. The King's Dilemma. The trumpets strike three rising notes. Harrow V, yada yada. The people erupt in cheer. Okay, so we already we already read that part. That's the first opening bit. Um, value of might. Okay, we don't have anything else unlocked there. Chronicles haven't really gone on. Mysteries, we haven't unlocked any of that. So let's look at this. The Council. You are members of the Council, a governing body ruling in the name of the King located in Libra, the capital city of the Kingdom of Ancast. You represent one of the twelve noble families who rule the duchies and marks into which the Kingdom is divided. Your main interest is, obviously, to make Ancast prosper. However, you are also trying to increase the power and prestige of your own family over the others. The game campaign spans decades and generations, so you will assume the role of a different representative of your house each game. You won't be the same person over multiple games. Uh, from what I read, it's like a four to six hour game. Uh, for one playthrough. The Kingdom of Ankist. Ankist is one of the largest states in Lewick, but it's not the only one. Ankist itself is a result of the union of many formerly independent kingdoms conquered in wars or united by diplomacy that were incorporated over the centuries as duchies and marks the north and south of Ankist in uncertain borders. The unclaimed borderlands are full of raiders, cutthroats, and dangerous nomadic tribes. The structure of the kingdom is feudal. The duchies and marks are managed by their ruling houses, represented by the players. These families are all loyal to the King of Ankist, but also have counts and barons that, are barons that are loyal to them. The houses are responsible for rallying the army, gathering taxes, and generally administering their territory in the name of the king. The king is personally assisted by the chamberlain, who will deal with the council about several general matters. The council can also rely on the royal treasurer, who is charged with monitoring the finances and dealing with the economy of the kingdom. Society, the merchants. There are entrepreneurs who run commercial activities and financial trading expeditions. They generally have a large income of fortune or fortune that they can rely on. To pursue their commercial interests, the merchants of Ankist unite themselves into local guilds. They don't usually behave as a unified faction because the various guilds may have diverging interests, but they periodically elect a guild master or mistress, who is considered neutral by all the guilds and speaks to the council for all of them. Common people. With their numbers and resiliency, they are the backbone of the kingdom. They mostly have humble jobs like farming, woodcutting, tailoring, or mining. They do not own any significant wealth, and the fruits of their work serve them just to get by. Their interests are defended by the tribune, an elected figure with a mandate of ten years who reports the problems of the common people into the council. The cult. The most influential high priestess of the cult sits on the circle of the blessed priestesses. Among them, a prior mother is selected as the leader of the cult through a specific ritual. It is said that the mother herself guides this decision. While not considered divine herself, the prior mother deals with doctrinal issues and is considered the voice of the mother in our world. Another extremely important figure of the Circle of the Blessed is the Holy Attendant, who deals with maternal prob material problems of the cult and often sits on the council to report on cult-related issues. Justice. With the conviction that each wrong must be followed by an equal and opposite reaction to restore balance, justice in the Kingdom of Ankist is commonly based on the law of retaliation. The more serious the felony, the more harsh the punishment. The more common crimes are dealt with by local judges, although the duke, marquis, or even the king may be consulted to ask for a pardon. On the other hand, the most ambiguous cases are brought to the attention of the first judge, an expert and wise man of law at the head of the Justice Court of Libra, who studies these matters and submits their advice to the council. Other regions. The rest of the known world. Despite Ankis being one of the most influential and powerful kingdoms of the world, it is not the only one. Two continents are known to the people of Ankist, the northern continent of Lewick, where the kingdom of Ankist is, and the mostly unknown southern continent, only known for the fierce ivory desert and the tales and legends shared by the few foreign travelers venturing to our lands. Kingdom of Muir. Ankist shares a border with Muir to the northwest. The two kingdoms used to be almost compar comparable in size a few decades back, but Muir is now much smaller after they lost a war against Ankist in the year 143. Still, it is culturally and technologically more advanced. Kingdom of Sidlata. The small and poor kingdom of Sidlata, to the south of Ankis, does not really have much to offer. Despite being completely harmless, it has not yet been conquered by any of its neighbors, only because its stingy lands are even more onerous to administer than they would be easy to conquer. The 
Republic of Calpius. The Republic of Calpius, despite ruling over the cold and rocky territories located to the northeast of the Kingdom of Ankist, has commercial abilities beyond imagination that more than compensate for the harshness of their homeland. Their leader, the Doge, is elected every five years among the most talented merchants, and despite having only limited powers, they are the head of their army of mercenaries, and, most importantly, they can veto the decisions of the Bank of Cards, one of the most influential banks in the whole world. The Kasuk Empire. Beyond the Chile Sea, the Kasuk Empire extends its territories for miles and miles to the distant east. Where is the sea if we only know about two continents? Most of its territories are barren steppes, frozen in winter and impossible to farm. Therefore, the majority of its population lives on the coasts of the Chile Sea, particularly in the Placid Waters Gulf. The Emperor, always accompanied by his personal guard, composed of the best fighters from the north, lives in opulence and luxury, just like his bureaucrats and nobles. Other subjects are miserable and beaten down. Southern Continent. Beside the coastal city-states, the southern continent is barely explored. The inland is apparently wholly occupied by a vast desert called the Ivory Desert, where no one can live, while a tall mountain range called the Nebula Mountains can cross it from north to south, splitting it in two halves. Religion. The Cult of the Mother. The Cult of the Mother is the only religion in the Kingdom of Ankist in, in most of the other known lands. The Mother is considered the only true goddess, and she is worshipped as a benevolent figure together, together with her eight saint daughters. However, especially in remote places, paganism is sometimes still present, but the cult treats it as superstition, claiming that the pagan gods are likely misinterpretations of the saint daughters. Dogma. The religion of the cult is based on the fact that all is created and regenerated by the mother. When you die, you go back to the mother's womb, where you will be regenerated before being born again. Birth and death are equally important. Birth can't be prevented in any way, and corpses must be buried in order to go back to the mother. The cult claims that the mother once walked in this world in human form to elevate humanity above the beasts, but she was not human. Heresies. This dogmatic truth has been questioned by several heretical theories in the past. A famous heresy theorized the existence of a ninth daughter and claimed that the mother was not an immortal goddess, but just the empress of an ancient civilization, part of a matrilineal dynasty, where the ninth daughter would inherit command. Another heresy asserts that the saint daughters are as divine as the mother. They would actually be her sisters, and the mother herself would be the aforementioned ninth. Yet another one says the saint daughters were actually the ancient pagan gods who were defeated by the mother and submitted to her will. These heresies are all vigorously denied by the cult. Daughters of the Mother The cult worships the mother and her saint daughters as a unity, but commoners may ask the favor of a specific daughter according to what they need. The saint daughters have a dual nature. They each represent a virtue they gifted to the world, and the avoidance of a vice that would, could have fost that could be fostered by an excess of that same virtue. In this sense, the saint daughters represent harmony and balance. Those who seek courage without recklessness will pray to Tilda. Those who seek strength and vigor without violence will pray to Orsel. Those who pray to Egna will have wisdom in and avoid folly. Those who seek creativity, arts, and games will pray to Lyria, who will tell them when playfulness must stop. Eri is the, god is the patron of love, but she is mindful to avoid jealousy. Those who need their business to thrive will ask Rayla to intercede for them, and they will be granted wealth as long as they are generous with it. Cerithus? Cerithus? Cerithus brings justice, but always with mercy. Those who seek rest or think they deserve to feast after a great effort will pray to Mir. My, my here. Mir. 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 <laughs> Without ending in laziness. Structure of the cult. The cult of the mother only allows women to join its ranks. The priestesses of the cult informally call each other sisters and live in monasteries. Priestesses can indulge in romantic relationships and have children. But they usually do not marry, even if it is not formally forbidden. They can raise their daughters at the monasteries until they reach puberty. Then the girls can choose to become priestesses themselves or to leave. If a priestess gives birth to a son, he will have to be raised by his father outside of the monastery. The monasteries are of different sizes and shapes, but all of them, from the smallest village monastery made of only two rooms to the biggest ones, which can host up to hundreds of priestesses, have a public space, where all the believers gather and assist in the rites, and a private space where the priestesses live and perform special rituals. Only priestesses can enter this space, but while lay women may occasionally be welcomed as guests, access is never allowed to men. The biggest monasteries are led by an elected figure called the High Priestess. History of the World. 
At the present time, Ankist is one of the strongest and largest kingdoms in the world and has enjoyed several decades of peace, but less than two centuries ago it was divided into many small kingdoms and raider tribes. Little is known about what happened before the Age of Fragmentation. Well, what we know for sure is that the lands of the current kingdom of Ankist, as well as most of the other known lands, were ruled by several lost civilizations throughout the ages. The monumental vestiges they left behind are present in most of the cities of the kingdom. Salan Union, around 800 years ago. All that remains of this great civilization are a few vestiges on the coasts of both the Siar Ocean and the Chile Sea. Ch Ch Chile, Chile Sea, I, I forget what I'm already naming these things, such as gigantic lighthouses in ruins or shipyards readapted throughout the centuries and still in use in some cities of the kingdom. Some say that in ancient times their rule spanned over the whole world. The Sabaean League, around 1100 years ago. Older ruins are present across the south of Ankist. Many market squares in the southern cities are built around these structures, and a few obelisks made from sculpted sandstone survive the test of time. The best relief scenes represented on these obelisks mainly depict scenes of trade, suggesting that commerce was the main strength of this civilization. The first king around 1400 years ago. Historians agree that all of the most ancient and time-worn monasteries of our kingdom, and beyond, were built by Omad, the legendary first king a historical yet almost mythical figure. His rule allegedly spanned over the whole world, and even though it ended hundreds of years before our kingdom was even born, our royal family claims to have a direct lineage from him. At the present time, he is praised more for bringing the cult of the mother to our continent and converting the northern pagan tribes than for his considerable military successes. He was so illustrious that every state claims to be his birthplace. Mythical history. Some historians suspect there was another forgotten empire that might have been the cradle of civilization. This belief comes from the many spurious copies of a legendary artifact that has been lost for centuries called the Golden Map. We've been seeking this item for decades. No avail. Okay. I think we will go through the houses some other time. I'll end this one here and I'll see you next time.